All right, hello everyone. Uh, is, there, or is anyone able to hear me? Just want to check just before we begin. And is everyone able to see the first slide of the presentation deck? All right, that sounds good. I'll go ahead and give it another uh, couple minutes just to let people trickle in. We'll get started probably in the next two to three minutes. So just hang back, sit tight. Um, and then we'll go ahead and uh, start the presentation. Thank you all for your patience and uh, signing up for the webinar. We appreciate you all uh, taking time out from your day to learn about clinical development. Okay, then uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. So uh, to introduce myself, my name is Roshan Chowdhury. I'm the current uh, Novartis Translational Clinical Oncology Fellow uh, under clinical development through the MCPHS uh, Fellowship Program. So the basic overview of today is just that we want to give a we wanted to have a chance and opportunity to engage pharmacy students across the country basically on what clinical development is and basically across the other various line functions. Uh, we wanted to have a chance to actually give students to, uh, an opportunity to learn about the line function itself before, you know, having to go and ask a fellow a question or before you even get to mid-year or some sort of recruiting event. So you have some sort of idea as to, you know, what the person does before you actually go into that conversation. So this was this series is meant to be educational in nature. So as for that reason, we're going to be looking to keep the uh, questions that we're going to answer today more related to clinical development. Any sort of um, general questions about fellowships and stuff, you can ask, uh, you can email um, our fellowship uh, email. Uh, it's included at the end of the slide. And from then on, we'll just go ahead and get started with the presentation then. So first, I have to give a disclaimer. Uh, the views in this presentation are solely my responsibility and do not reflect their official reviews, official views of Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research or Novartis as a whole. And with that said, we'll get started. So for, clini for the clinical development, we kind of have to break things up into our trial phases which kind of can be broken down into the drug discovery phase, uh, preclinical testing, phase one, two, three trials, and then going to, into the regulatory process in order for the drug to actually get approved, and then your post-marketing analysis. And what this slide is basically supposed to represent is that this process is lengthy, and the attrition that you're going to see 
is very, very high. You're going to end up seeing what may be two to 5,000 targets hits per se, um, basically making its way down to about one that actually gets approved by the FDA. And so what our focus is generally on is more so in the clinical phase testing rather than the discovery or preclinical testing. But we're going to go over um, each parts each parts of the uh, puzzle um, in the next coming slides. So one of the things I wanted to emphasize is the importance of your clinical research, your preclinical testing, uh, because everything that you see in the package insert comes from a clinical study, whether that comes down to the mechanism of action, the pharmacokinetic profile, the drug-drug interactions, any sort of renal or hepatic adjustments you see, everything is coming from some form of a clinical trial. So it's just to, this, this slide is just so you guys see what the impact of it is um, on a large scale basis. This is what actually makes it into the package insert. And to start with our preclinical studies, then we'll start with a discovery uh, phase. But the one thing that everyone needs to keep in mind, regardless of you know whatever part of the process that you're involved in, is that drug development should begin and end with the patient in mind. So when we are actually trying to figure out what goes on in this in these patients, we have to be able to have some sort of mechanistic link to the disease that we are trying to target. So that way, when we go and look for a compound identification that might actually have some sort of activity uh, at the at that mechanistic target, we're able to figure out you know which which drugs that we should actually try and target with. So. This is basically done either through some sort of high throughput screen of like a giant compound library, or you actually uh, determine what the target is and you do some sort of crystal structure, like some crystallography. So that way you can figure out what the molecule looks like in space and then target the drug appropriately from there. And from there, once you identify some of those targets, you need to test your hypotheses uh, in vitro, then in animal models of disease, uh, and then you can go into some of the human tissue. And once you actually get to this point, you know, and you have some sort of idea of how your drug um, will act in space, you'll go and actually get it patented and uh, make it your intellectual property. So that's the discovery portion of it. Going into preclinical uh, testing, this is basically where you're trying to under get the basic ide idea of how your, your drug is going to act in the body. So these are your animal models of the diseases. So you do this to kind of figure out what your dose finding toxicology studies are. And this is done using what we call good manufacturing process, clinical grade material, um, and then using GLP toxicology studies. And then once all those, to once the, the toxicology of the new compound that you're looking at has been verified and you have that data available, you can put that together in an application to be submitted to the regulatory agency and the clinical site. So, uh, for example, large cancer institutes, you could do at large academic centers. These clinical sites will receive what, a, you know, your investigators brochure, a clinical protocol, and then the regulatory agencies will receive what's called an investigational new drug or clinical trial application filing, basically used to allow you to test your drug in humans for the first time. So from this point forward, we enter what's called the phases of clinical research. This is where you actually bring, you actually are allowed to uh, target, um, you know, you're allowed to look for the uh, patients in the study that you want to test for. So uh, this is very general. Obviously, there are nuances between oncology, rare diseases that you might not see in the more general medicine uh, aspects of these uh, clinical trials. But in general, your phase one trials, you're focused more on the safety, tolerability, and the pharmacokinetic and dynamic profile of your medication. You're looking for a small number of healthy volunteers because you're just looking to see how the drug is going to behave in the human body. So moving on, once you have determined that there, that your drug is tolerable, that it can be safely administered to a patient, you move on to the phase two portion where you are now enrolling um, hundreds of patients with the target disease that you are looking to possibly um, you know, uh, target for a indication standpoint. 
and you're still focused on primarily safety, but you're also starting to look for some efficacy, some evidence that the drug is actually going to work in this patient population. And once you have the efficacy, once you have that safety and like take uh, characterized, you'll move into the large phase three trials. This is what we call our pivotal trials, where you enroll large numbers of patients, hundreds to thousands, where you're trying to confirm what you found previously and then obviously you need to be able to you know, compare what is, how does your, your drug therapy compare to the current standard of care or placebo if there is no standard of care. And then obviously you also need to be able to characterize what the AE, the adverse events profile looks like. And then once after your drug is FDA approved, you have your post-marketing analysis, which is basically how your drug works in real life because because in real life, you know, patients are taking more than one drug. They're taking a, a, different, a myriad of different uh, medications. And some physicians will, look, will be evaluating their own uh, risk-benefit profile as well. So this is where you're really looking at the long-term safety, the effectiveness, and then obviously the cost-effectiveness utility measures that you're looking at to assess value of your medication over time. So are, is, is there issues with uh, sound? I just want to clarify, are you guys able to hear me? I will assume so. So I guess to get into the details of the uh, phase one trials, Okay, that's good. To, okay, so that's good to that's good to hear. There, that it does work. So I guess I'll I'll continue, and then obviously, if there's any sorts of um, questions you all have, anything that needs to be clarified, please feel free to um, ask those questions in the chat, and then I'll make and I'll clarify it afterwards. We have a long Q and A session to make sure that we're able to answer these questions. All right. And if any of you are using Internet Explorer. I would recommend um, using Google using Google Chrome or Firefox. It is actually not compatible with Internet Explorer. All right, then. So I'll go ahead and continue. So with the phase one trials and outcomes, basically, as I mentioned before, you're looking at safety, efficacy, and then you're looking to see how the, the body interacts with the medication. How does it get rid of it? And then there are some exploratory analysis depending on what type of trial you're running, especially within oncology. You, you might be assessing whether or not your drug is working much earlier than a phase two trial. And the whole goal of this phase one trial is to get to what we call a maximum tolerated dose, where you're able to determine what your recommended phase two study dose is going to be. And so this study dose is what you're gonna be taking into your early phase two studies before you decide if you need to figure out if there's gonna be some sort of dose finding studies, which is more so aligned in the latter half portions of it. And so that dose finding studies in the subsequent clinical phases, it's either, it's broken up basically into a couple of portions. So a phase two A study is basically, you're looking in some sort of exploratory study that's looking to see if there's some sort of efficacy or biological activity um, in patients or healthy volunteers. And then in the phase 2B, as I mentioned before, this is where you're kind of looking for a dose range. You're looking to find, you know, how much, how much efficacy do you see at particular doses? And then it kind of, and depending on the situation, as I said before, if like in the rare disease or the oncology spaces, these phase two studies can also be used as pivotal trials. That's basically going to be sent to the FDA if the drug is intended to treat a life-threatening or a very severely debilitating uh, disease. And then, and then your traditional phase three, this is basically where you are giving it to a very large group of people to confirm the effectiveness that you saw previously in the phase two study, or you're going into the, um, or you're really looking into monitor the side effects 
or if you're going to look into the uh, comparativeness and any other sort of um, information that you need to collect regarding the drug itself or basically to make sure that you're able to administer the treatment safely. So for the new drug application, which comes after all of the clinical trial uh, phases have been completed, this is basically a formal proposal for the FDA to approve your product and the product labeling, that package insert that we went over at the very beginning in the US. So this is very, so this is specific to the US. As you all know, drugs can be approved across the entire globe and the European uh, agency requirements are, can be different from those uh, even across Japan, China, or other parts in Asia and in the different parts of the world. And so these clinical items that the FDA may actually evaluate when they're looking at these NDAs can include those pivotal studies to, you know, to assess the validity of them. Of them. It's often why you see uh, companies will run more than one study and you'll look into the replicability of these pivotal studies to make sure that they're consistent, um, how generalizable they are, and then the other thing to think about, how clinically relevant are the efficacy results, right? So you're thinking about the value of adding, so for example, if you're thinking about the value of adding another statin to the market when we already have things like a torvastatin or a suvastatin versus something such as the case where you're looking at the, seri the seriousness of the safety profile where the, where Realistically, there if there might be there there could the drug actually could have some sort of benefit, but if you can't identify the population that it would benefit the most from without minimizing the safe the safety risks involved, that's also something they may consider, which brings us back to the risk benefit ratio uh, profile. So these are just things that can be considered when you are considering um, that new drug application. Now. The thing is, you know, what is it that I do? Where do I fit in this whole, I guess, puzzle piece? And so for me, I fit in as a clinical project manager, blended in with some of the sciences involved. So in the clinical trial stages, we have, you know, we are involved all the way from developing the, the study, the protocol itself, to starting it, conducting it, which in our case, my case would be running a dose escalation uh, meetings to assess the maximum tolerated dose because I'm in early phase and then closing out the study, which includes all of these things that were detailed. So when we talk about developing the study, you know, we mentioned before, you have to put into, you have to put together the package for the IND submission. You have to get IRB approval. You have to get, um, the, or health authority, if it, depending out if it's in Europe, they have a, they don't, they're, think, they're not an IRB per se, but they have their own ethics committee. And then you also have to uh, get your protocol approved uh, by your internal um, review committee as well. So if you're looking at the start of the study, you know you have to get your sites going, and then that first patient first visit, it's a mile, it's a milestone in study development where that's a very when that happens, you are actually able to start forecasting certain aspects of your trial. And as you enroll and you are in that maintenance portion, you're running those dose escalation meetings to determine what that maximum tolerated dose is. You're eventually going to find it. And once you do find that maximum tolerated dose or you or you decide you, or the, the study has to get closed down for whatever reason, could be for a safety reason, could have, it could be a very serious um, adverse side effect. You reach what's called that last patient, last visit, which is a key marker for the closing out of a clinical trial, which includes database lock, the CSR reports and then archiving it. So what 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 is it actually that I do? So my role event, my end game is to eventually be a clinical trial manager, a clinical trial leader, uh, as is the title at uh, Novartis. The whole idea, the whole concept is in a nutshell, project management. So we call this the hub of the clinical trial wheel. The CTL is in the middle. And the reason why I say it's in the middle is because we are we are involved. We have a hand in almost every aspect that you see around it, from choosing our vendors that we use to collect our EKG data or our um, labs, down to the sites that we choose, the clinical trial team itself, because we are try we, we, our, jo our job is to lead a team. And then obviously your team can, your team members can be across the entire globe. Um, you're looking into your resourcing, whether or not something will move into the late phase, the documentation, um, your interactions with the regulatory people, 
and preclinical and safety as well. It's interesting. Preclinical is, is still going to be involved at the early phase because you're still running the long-term animal studies to confirm some of the toxicities you're seeing, and that goes into the investigator brochures. And so this and safety pharmacovigilance, you'd imagine like I have to interact. I interact with them in order for uh, for to me in order for me to actually get the safety data, or when if I have a deliverable, I have to have their input into that process. So in a way, I have a chance to really, I get, it, I get, it, I get the benefit of kind of learning about the other line functions um, as well, so just because I'm required to, you know, get, gather their inputs and, you know, put, build a picture together. So that's the hub of the trial wheel. So this is called the, cl the clinical trial team members. So the medical officer is usually an MD. I want you to imagine like your health authority is usually the contact from FDA or the EMA. Uh, contract research organizations provide services like, for example, I mentioned like vendors who we use to collect our EKG data or other labs. Those, those research organizations can provide those services to us. And we previously mentioned our ethics committees as well as the principal investigators at each site, our regulatory affairs person. Uh, the case report forms are basically uh, the forms in which our data capture response tools are actually collecting information into. There's also a pharmacokineticist, a person whose job is basically to characterize the PKPD profile of the drug, which is also a position available for pharmacists as well, as well as your data managers and then folks who are involved in document operations, basically making sure that your 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 what we call a trial master file is in such health, in such a way that if the FDA were to ask for it, that you would be able to give them the documents that they were needed in order to answer and audit correctly, properly. So basically, you know, in study in the startup phase, you have your database build. You have the you have to pick your vendors, feasibility, IRB approval, regulatory submission. You have to think about drug supply as well. All these folks are involved in the beginning of the studies in order for you to be able to actually go and get the first patient dosed. All of this has to be done either beforehand or very close to the, or, or just before that you have that first patient first visit, just so you have enough drug supply at each site. So that way you have the vendors who need, if you need to collect EKGs or certain types of lab parameters that you can't get locally, you have all that in place. So all of this is done before you even have your first patient. In the maintenance portion of it, you may have the dose escalation meetings, as I had mentioned. You have monitoring visits to make sure that sites are in compliance. And then you're looking at some sort of interim analysis if that's built into your study, data review, uh, recruitment timelines, and any contingency plans that occur because things don't always go as planned. So all of this can be, uh, excuse me, as part of the study maintenance. And then once you get to close out, Basically, at this point, you're, you're, you're analyzing your samples to really get an idea of how your drug is, you know, acting biologically, how it's being processed by the body, for, you know, from a kinetic standpoint. And then this and then data cleaning. Uh, this is making sure that your data is entered in such a way that is ready to be analyzed. And then once those two things are taken care of, you reach a point, you reach a very important point in your study called the database lock. Once that lock has occurred, you are not able to go back and change anything. Your data is considered final. And then from there, you go to site closeout. And then from your once your sites are closed out, database has been locked. You don't have to make go back and make any changes to your data. You write that clinical study report. And this study report is basically the story of your trial. So that basically is everything that you know I can be involved in in a nutshell as a clinical trial. Uh, leader fellowship, uh, leader fellow in my fellowship program. I can tell you I have been involved. I've, I've led some of the um, deliverables that we had for some of our programs. And in one of those, it's one of those situations where I really like being able to get a hand in everything. So what we have now is uh, uh, any questions you guys ask, you guys have, you can um, write them in the uh, chat portion. I'll try and get to as many of them as I can. I'll start with some of the ones that I have seen, obviously through the um, through the Google Forms. I'll start with those initially, 
And then we have our contact info. General information for the our fellowship programs is the first one. That's the mcphs.edu one. And then anything specific to the Novartis fellowships is the Novartis in, uh, email below. So I'll go ahead and pull up the questions that we got uh, beforehand. And then you guys can type questions as we go, all right? And so one of the first questions that we had is I want to answer right away is is a residency needed for for to be able to go into uh, a fellowship program like this and the first thing I will say is you do not need a residency beforehand um, it's not needed I also want to answer this uh, second question real quick and this one is related to how much patient interaction I have as a clinical development fellow I actually do not have any patient interaction uh, my interaction basically came down to um, the way I interact with patients is realistically through the data that comes through through our electronic data capture system, helping clean it, making sure that we are able to tell the story of those patients. And I chose that because of, and for me, I'm okay with that because I want to have, a, I guess, a big picture impact on patients rather than that one-on-one -on -one, um, patient interaction per se. Another question that we had we had gotten is that um, they had I got is what are some personality qualities that are desired in a clinical development fellow? I will say that a lot of it is related to being a pharmacist. You know, we're very detail oriented. Um, you know, we you know it's almost it's almost to the point. You know, people joke about you know we're very neurotic in a sense. So very uh, committed to detail. Um, one of the things is that because we're a pharmacist, you know, we 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 go through a lot of training in order to learn how to interact with people, interact with patients, interact with physicians. So we are able to interact with many different groups of people. So our ability to understand the needs of different stakeholders is very key, critical, and it's a very good personality trait to have. And then I guess the other thing, I guess the last thing that, you know, and it's something that really can't measure is just natural curiosity and, you know, and, and wanting to continue to find ways to be better. The nature of their fellow of a clinical development fellowship is usually longitudinal in nature. It's not, we don't have really any rotations per se. And because of that reason where it's very important that you are continually asking questions and thinking about the process as you move along in the fellowship program. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and answer some of the questions I see in the chat. So I will go ahead and get started. So the first thing I kind of notice is that the role that a new PharmD graduate can obtain. So there are folks that you're going to find is that the majority of pharmacists in industry have actually not done a fellowship. So the way they have found their way through a through, you know, getting their way into industry is, you know, doing temporary contract work, either through a CRO or getting involved in like a medical affairs team. And then from there, building, you know, their connections, building that foundational knowledge needed so that once you start looking for those other positions, you have something to uh, kind of point to as your ability to interact in a team, your ability to. Uh, understand what is, you know, pharma or what is that particular line function, what the needs are. So I would say that uh, fellowship is not the only way in. And you, and I can tell you, and I can tell you just by the fact that the most of the pharmacists in industry are not, are not, have not done fellowships. So the other question I see, the next question I see is the uh, phase two recommended dose uh, determined as a certain percentage of the maximum tolerated dose. So to, I guess, clarify, because I really, I, I guess I was not clear about that, is that the recommended phase two dose and the maximum tolerated dose should actually be the same exact thing. Um, they, the, it's basically, in a, nut, in a, I guess to explain to you quickly, in oncology, we hit what we call a maximum tolerated dose, where you keep cycling, um, you keep running dose escalation meetings until you hit a dose in which you're, in which the toxic, the tolerability profile 
um, is too much. And so you go one step beneath that and we call that our MTD. And that MTD is the dose you usually take into your phase two study. So uh, the next question is related to what the pharmacokineticist does. That person, their entire purpose is to make, is to help characterize the pharmacokinetic profile of the drug. They actually use software that's used to characterize how the elimination of the drug is occurring in the body. That's why we do have those blood drugs. If you recall from your, if, if some of you all should have had your um, pharma, your PK classes, your not your non-clinical PK classes, where basically they do some sort, they do a blood draw, you know, 30 minutes, half, um, one hour, one and a half hour, two hours, three hours, as as needed. You know, you that interval is determined beforehand as to how they actually go about. Um, you know, characterizing that profile. So based off all those blood draws, they're able to determine what the um, elimination profile looks like, you know, whether it's one compartment or two compartment model or it's a zero order kinetics. So that's the type of role that the kineticist plays. So the next question we'll look at is how many clinical program fellowship positions are available at Novartis and in the MCPHS fellowship program. So that I can say is there's three um, clinical development positions within Novartis. I know Pfizer has one as well as within, at least within MCPHS and, you know, and Novartis. And then the other thing I kind of noticed, I'll, I'll, I'll try, I'm trying to answer as many of the clinical program questions as I can. So the other thing is, do you have to travel? Uh, my role does not require me to travel uh, since most of my studies are, my studies don't travel. So I, I usually handle things myself. When there's a, a site initiation visit, uh, depending where it is, I may travel to that site be, to deliver the presentation in person. But most of the time we're able to do it just over email. Not over email, I, I apologize, over um, either Skype for business or a, a VMR type conference. Um, the next, I see a question, uh, were the skills that you were not trained in during the pharmacy curriculum that you found yourself needing to quickly develop on your own? So yes, there are some things that you can't learn from pharmacy school. And the one thing that's really difficult to gain, even on APP rotations, is being able to juggle many things all at once. And now you might wonder, like, it's one thing to be able to juggle, you know, class life with your student organization life, you know, with work and everything. But those are all separate things. I want you to imagine being able to juggle 20 things related to a study all at once. And so that project management type uh, skill set you needed I think you you guys can look up things like Lean or Six Sigma type uh, project management skills. Those are things that I kind of had to learn to pick up uh, fairly quickly. Um, you know, the the learning curve is steep, but it's um, but it, you know that's part of that's part of the enjoyment of these postgraduate programs. It's that the pace is very very fast. Um, the biggest thing by far was definitely the project management skills. You'd be surprised how useful it is to have your clinical knowledge because sometimes the medical officers don't have time to make the clinical queries and the data management from a data perspective. And you as a pharmacist have, uh, have so much that you're able to do. As, so as long as you don't end up making like a safety decision, there's a lot of uh, queries that you can, you know, a lot of data cleaning that you can contribute to with your clinical knowledge that um, people without that expertise are not able to apply. And so when I got the next one, so, what kind of experiences should you get prior to to prepare for a fellowship? Um, I'm the type of I'm I'm a bit different. I didn't actually have any sort of rotational experiences at all um, during my uh, pharmacy curriculum that were industry based. Um, I actually most of what I brought brought into it was that project management role. So I had a rotation experience where I had to have helped function as a uh, operations pharmacist more. So I was kept downstairs in the hospital to help my preceptor uh, making, you know, making sure that the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, requirements of the pharmacy in order for it to run 
um, doing retrospective uh, reviews of the medications that are dispensed, why is it being dispensed, as well as looking for opportunities to perhaps change the way physicians kind of um, prescribe medica medications or what types of order medication orders they're putting in. You kind of, you, I was there to help manage that portion of it. So I actually got to build some project management skills. I also ended up having a, I also ended up having what we call um, a rotation experience through Moffitt Cancer Center. And I was able to, you know, sit in at their phase one trial meetings where they were talking about their statistical approach. Um, we got, got a chance to look into, uh, you know, the, the meetings where they would go over the interim analysis as well, as well as, you know, journal clubs, yeah, preparing for, you know, preparing medication orders. I actually got a chance to interact with patients and really, um, it really helped me, you know, decide on oncology, you know, that rotation at Moffitt. And then I guess the big thing is, uh, I, for me, as I had a lot of clinical research experience coming in, and for me, I knew that I wouldn't, that this role is a blend between clinical research and clinical operations. But for me, I've done the research for years. I want to have the operational role. I want to understand, you know, how do I take these trials, these huge, tri you know, these very important trials and take it across multiple sites across the country, across the globe. That aspect is very interesting to me. And so those are the types of things that I came into looking, for, you know, preparing for a fellowship. But any sort of industry like rotation during your fourth year, any sort of internship you can get, any chance you can get to expose yourself to the pharmaceutical industry, to get a chance to, you know, ask people questions, understand where they fit in this picture would benefit you for fellowship regardless, or even in clinical development. Um, so the fellowship program, mine's is specifically two years. Uh, I know that there are other programs like one uh, through USC that are one year in length uh, for their clinical development position. So it just really depends on what type of um, program you're looking for and just making sure you kind of go into, um, you kind of go and do your homework going into it. So I guess, the, so yeah, I figured I'd get this question eventually. So what does my normal day look like? And in all honesty, I can't, my no day looks the same for me. Uh, as a fellow, I may be involved, you know, when I first started, it was probably geared more towards uh, the, all the trainings I had to do, which literally took one month to complete, along with the MCPHS program requirements that we have, that we do like a conference, you know, we have a conference series and preparing for that. And as I started getting more experience along with it, I actually started managing my own, uh, managing a vendor for a study, uh, you know, you know, within three months of me being there. And then from, you know, then on, you know, I may be contributing to a dose escalation meeting. And then once I got to January, I was uh, contributing to the uh, report that was actually supposed to go out to the FDA for one of our clinical programs. And that process literally took from January to the submission point in March. And that required me to interact with people in regulatory affairs, people within pharmacovigilance, very cross-functional in nature. And it really helped me learn to appreciate, you know, the other line functions and what they bring to the process and how they contribute. So uh, I would say my normal day can be just about anything. As of right now, I am a, I'm a, I'm actually the lead clinical lead for three studies, two of which I'm just working to archive to close out completely, and then one of which is actually uh, on a study uh, enrollment halt. And so there's differences in that close out phase that actually occurred that I'm trying to, and those nuances that I'm trying to pick up now. So that can easily change even within a month from now. Um, I also see a question. Do you have to immediately apply for a fellowship after getting your PharmD or can you get one at any time? Any time, as long as you have your PharmD, it doesn't have to be right out of school. Uh, quickly to answer that. I'm just trying to look for more clinical development oriented ones. Uh, you know, we still have a lot of time at this webinar. It says to run till 645, but we're here. I'm here till seven um, to answer questions if needed. Um, so, uh, what activities or organizations did you partake in in pharmacy school to prepare my, for myself for a clinical development fellowship? So, I actually spent very little time within student organization or roles. I came into pharmacy school having had my leadership skills developed. Uh, one of the things that I that I think was important for me is that I had found my voice. I wasn't afraid to voice my opinion 
but I understood the importance of doing your homework before you voice your opinion, or otherwise you really look, um, you know, look like a fool if you don't understand what you're talking about. So most of what I uh, did in school was related to research. I was an informatics intern for two summers, and I found my, my long-term pharmacy school mentor uh, there. We developed um, a novel health information exchange model um, that, <laughs> that we actually see is starting to get implemented by some of the um, companies like Apple, what they're doing with their HLA-7 fire specifications that they're, I think they're working it across with like 12, com, you know, 12 um, hospital systems right now. You know, we, we, unfortunately, we weren't able to bring our concept into fruition, but it's interesting to see, you know, the other companies out there that are actually doing it. So I was more involved definitely on the research end, and it's kind of something where it was, I call it serendipity, and that I was a very research driven person. I was, I'm very interested in things like uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, the impact of things like blockchain and healthcare. And it just so happens, you know, you find your way into, you find that there are fellowships available in the industry that value um, people who have those types of skill sets. So I, I, I call it serendipity more than anything else. Um, so I see there's a question about additional responsibilities I have to the fellowship. So naturally, one of the things is that it is, as we are not a standalone fellowship program, it's not just an Novartis thing, it's, it's MCPHS. So there are role, so the, the things like I mentioned, we have things like a conference series uh, where we are, we each a group of companies put together, it can be a group of companies or it could be one company depending on how large the fellowship program is. We basically put something together to um, answer, you know, it's to create like a professional development uh, day per se for one day. And then the second day is more of like a uh, presentation day for the fellows to have some sort of themed um, idea. So we had things like patient engagement and precision medicine or future of pharma. So those are the types of things that we can develop in there. So those are other additional responsibilities as things you can see as well. Like, well, you can, I can, I can definitely answer that. Uh, a little bit later in more detail. So are there opportunities for career development in uh, clinical operations, clinical development basically? So one of the unique things that I mentioned is that because I have my hand in so many other line functions, I can actually start to learn what they do. So don't be surprised that you're able to, that as long as you explore, you know, at least what I've understood is that if you explore and expose yourself early on, it is totally um, possible to make a lateral transition into say regulatory affairs or quality assurance later on down the road. Um, interestingly, or you can move up the ladder in clinical development and going from a trial leader perspective to um, an operate, uh, an op a head of an operation of a group operations um, instead. So there's definitely role uh, move, ability to move both vertically and horizontally. It just comes down to you, um, your ability to understand the needs going forward, and and realistically, you know, keeping up with the times because things change very quickly. So, the does Novartis have an opening for an internship or volunteering clinical development? Um, so, our summer summer scholars program, we actually have a program where we have interns. Uh, they actually started today. And then um, we don't really have any volunteer positions available, but th I know that there are there are certain schools that have agreements with our with some of the Novartis um, preceptors that actually can let them do a some sort of early IPPE rotation. Uh, we are thinking about doing an APP rotation. The issue is with develop clinical development. In order for you to really gain anything, you ha it's it's a time sensitive type thing. So. You, the, the longer you're here, the more you're able to see and then you get more value out of it. So it's just one of those things where you kind of, you know, you kind of have to look at. Um, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, things are still in the works, per se. Uh, yes, Novartis has a fellowship in New Jersey. That is the Rutgers program. And let's see, I'm a second. I'm a second year student. And I was wondering where to go to learn about rotations for students interested in doing one in the final year of pharmacy school. This is one of those cases I where being proactive is very helpful. Uh, get in touch, you know, with you know, get in touch through your folks, your your folks at your school to see if they have connections. You'd be surprised who your faculty actually know. 
Uh, I mean, one of my classmates was actually able to get a rotation at Novartis. I didn't even know, realize this because his one of the faculty mentors and advisors actually had contacts um, at a contact available. So first utilize, you know, your faculty. And then obviously, if they don't have those contacts available, you know, be bold and reach out to, you know, fellows or reach out to someone with an industry and see, you know, and get and build a relationship early on and you know might be one of those cases where after two years you know you built a relationship and you're able to get that rotation so just be proactive about it and uh let's see are there opportunities for bench side research and development for pharmacists or is r d mainly reserved for md phds uh so it actually depends on the fellowship so if you i would imagine like for example we have a biomarker development fellowship um, it is definitely still operations heavy, but it's also interesting in the fact that uh, some of our some of the fellows have been involved in assay development previously. So uh, it's it was interesting for um, you know my current uh, co-fellow, who his name is Jimmy. He's the current biomarker fellow, so he actually has the opportunity to help develop some of the assays that are involved in analyzing some of the uh, biological samples that they see. So realistically, it comes down to the to the position and you as a pharmacist going out and being proactive and really being the expert. So it's something to understand is that when you are developing those assays, per se, you know, you are if you if you know, in school, they tell you it's OK, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you. Right. I'll get back to you. I'll answer your question, um, you know, within 24 hours. The issue is in pharma, if you know, you might get a chance to say that once before, you know, if you keep saying it repeatedly, then you're not, these people are experts and they're gonna see you as someone as a non-expert. So it's one of those cases is you have to build your value to them as a pharmacist. And it's really, and it's really just demonstrating the value of the pharmacist. So especially if you're a PharmD PhD, there, there's definitely roles depending on the culture of the company, um, whether it's a smaller biotech versus a larger biotech, you might be able to get involved in that aspect as well. It just comes down to your experiences as a person and then the needs of the company itself. Um, let's see. So I have a question and that's basically, my role sounds very supervisorial visorial i'm sorry <laughs> based on your description but to what level are am i involved in all of the data that's collected so my my role is as a manager is is more of like project manager but so to give you an example of how the data collection process works is that you know a patient is enrolled into the study that data is collected by the study personnel at that site they enter it into our electronic data capture system and that data and the data that's entered into that capture system is what I see here at Novartis. And so that's how the that process works. So I don't actually go in and I'm not involved in collecting it myself. That's why, you know, that's what the site is for. But my role is basically to make sure, you know, does the data enter look, you know, look, look clean? Does it look correct? Uh, sometimes they may accidentally input information in the wrong CR, you know, uh, document page in the electronic data capture system. So my involvement is, you know, making sure that it's ready and prepared for something like a dose escalation meeting or an interim analysis, uh, making sure things are clean and ready to go. Uh, the next, there's a question, is there a pharmacist in each project or just one? So uh, to give you an example of how wonderful why i enjoy pharma so much is that there are so many different perspectives there are actually two pharmacists on the floor right now in 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 my department one is myself and the other is my former second year fellow who is currently now full-time employee there so it's one of those cases where it's specifically you know we different people bring different things to the table and it's realistically making sure you are the project manage that project management aspect first, but you can easily understand where you bring value as a clinician to the table. And for that, and I and I'm able to see where I bring value. I and my manager has told me he has where he thinks he has seen the value just from me in my first year, even though I've only been here for one year. So uh, to to answer your question, you know, there's many opportunities for a pharmacist to be there, but there's not necessarily a pharmacist on each team. 
even though you can understand that there is value of having a clinician, you know, a clinical voice, an additional clinical voice on each team if possible. All right. So this, oh yeah, I don't think I mentioned this. And so the fellowship, the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research here is located in Cambridge. I don't think I mentioned that. Um, so another question is what can you do while still in pharmacy school to start building connections in the industry? So you've already done a good, everyone on here has done a good job doing that because they are on this webinar. And I tell and I and I encourage each and every one of you, if you want to, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can ask questions through this fellowship email where all the where, like these contact information is available is there so we can a answer your questions and tell you what we have available or what's in the works at the time. You know, the best way to learn about these roles is to be able to talk to people, because sometimes you really can't um, answer or understand something until someone kind of puts it in a context that's meaningful to you. So. That's something just coming to this webinar is is something, you know, you've done to help um, build a connection. Other times it's maybe, you know, cold emailing someone, um, cold connecting with someone on LinkedIn and, you know, being proactive about it. Uh, IPHO, if you're not aware of, is the industry pharmacist organization. It's very young, but it's, um, I'm very impressed with how quickly they've been able to mobilize, uh, get people connected with pe uh, folks across the industry. So that's a possible uh, avenue as well. And don't forget about AMCP. So that I know AMCP has a smaller scope of pharma, but if you're interested in things like HUR or value of value, uh, value propagation proposition, you know, those types of things are areas where some certain industry pharmacists are also, um, you know, involved in as well. So you can do those types of things, you know, to start building those connections. Um, let's see. What was the time frame from graduating NAPLEX and fellowship? So I'm going to tell you all something very interesting. Depending on what your role is, you may not be required to be licensed. And so for me, I actually chose to forego getting licensed after, after uh, school was over. This for, because for me, I did not see enough value in getting licensed for what I'm looking for out of my career long term. And so you know, I can tell you immediately and I can tell you what every single person with a um, functioning brain will tell you. That is a very bad idea. You should get licensed and I will be the first person to tell you to do as I say and not as I do. And I would recommend getting licensed. But for me, I uh, for me, there wasn't much value to it. So I can tell you that um, you want to make sure you get your NAPLEX and um, state uh, licensing exams out of the way as fast as possible because uh, early on in the fellowship when you have less responsibility you can at least have time to study for it per se but once you are in my role where I'm now I am currently a study manager for three trials and I've taken on additional responsibilities within the, M the academic component of the fellowship program it becomes very difficult to find time to study so uh, I would recommend, you know, anyone who's looking from, you know, graduation to NAPLEX to fellowship, you know, you, I graduated back in May. Some people graduate in June and you need to it's, it's a lot of things all at once. But you have to start finding time to study for your NAPLEX, especially if you graduate late, but you finish rotations early, start studying early. So that way you're prepped early enough. So that way you can schedule your exams early and um, moving along. So, yeah, just to give an idea about that. Is there a difference between year one and year two of Novartis' clinical development fellowship program, or does your role just gradually progress as you gain more experience? It's definitely the latter. As you um, start moving along, you definitely start getting more experience, and your role starts to expand, and that's been the case for me. Um, and then how competitive is the hiring process for new hires for industry positions if you don't get into a fellowship? I can tell you that it can be very tough. It's just why I encourage uh, you know you all to get if you are if you are set on in the pharmaceutical industry after graduation and in the event you don't get a fellowship you have what I really recommend doing is evaluating you know what it is that you want um, for example if you're going into like a medical affairs position you know having a residency might actually be very helpful uh, for you in that sense because you have that clinical uh, background 
that's important for uh, roles such as the medical science liaison position and stuff. So it really comes down to, um, you know, what it is that you want long term and then, you know, acting accordingly. Um, how do I find out about opportunities available in, I think that's in Miami. I'm not sure if there were opportunities in Miami. I apologize for my um, ignorance if I didn't know that. So do you usually work in a team or more independently in clinical development? So we are team oriented, but my team can span across, you know, I have like for, to give you an example, I have a project associate. She sits, you know, right, you know, near me on the office floor. My data manager is out in Ireland. My, one of my, my trial operations manager, he's out in East Hanover. And I have, and, and to give you an example for when I had to deliver, help get the um, FD, the deli deliver the uh, safety update for the FDA back from January to March, um, you know, my, the data manager for that study, there's a different study altogether. He was out in, you know, England. I'm in, I'm in Cambridge. Someone is out in the regulatory affairs per, uh, folk is out in East Hanover. Our pharmacovigilance specialist and our medical writer were both out in India. So it, it, it's very much can be a very, um, very, it can be a very uh, tricky situation if you're not very well organized and stuff. So it, it's very team oriented. It's just that Novartis is a global company and that's part of the enjoyment behind it. Um, so what do you enjoy most about your job and what's your least favorite part of the job? The best part, the thing that makes everything worthwhile to me at the end of the day is, you know, I'm in oncology and one of the things when I was at Moffitt is that some of these patients, like, I'll never forget like a patient telling me like, you know, how much they appreciated me helping them, you know, I was just counseling them on their supplements. And, you know, these people, you know, their cancer patients are different and, you know, when you're in the early phase part of a trial, you you really don't, there has to be some sort of leap of faith that has to occur because these patients don't know, you don't know what's gonna happen. And so for that reason, when you really have the situation where, you know, you don't, these patients who are coming to you, they're not healthy volunteers in phase one. For oncology patients, these are people who are usually being told they have months left to live, and they're literally just trying to buy, a, you know, another couple of months, just trying to get to something important to them that's that's important to them, or they understand that there might not be any benefit at all, but they want to contribute to the growing body of research. So there's nothing more exciting, you know, when you when you know a couple months ago when you see a patient who has a cancer, who has a who has a tumor type that's very non-responsive to some of these newer uh, chemo uh, immunotherapy agents and to see them going into remission or like near remission to me that makes everything worthwhile that make to me that's why you know it makes it, it makes me it makes me feel like I have made an impact uh, i guess the least favorite part of the job is all the is you know it's really funny right it's it's the amount of organization and effort and energy that has to go into keeping yourself organized. So many things happen all at once. So, and I, and growing up, I was never the most organized person. So I saw it's a skill I had to kind of develop as I, as I went along, even, you know, even every day, it's just one of those situations where you're really trying to, um, you know, make sure you keep everything, all your eggs in a basket, making sure you don't forget something, making sure you follow up on a timely basis. It's, it's that part is definitely tough. It's definitely my least favorite portion of it, but it's no less important than what I do, um, obviously. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely those are definitely challenges that I definitely enjoy. Um, but yeah, I think we're gonna. I think I'll call it um, for right now in terms of questions. Again, if you guys have any any lingering questions, if I didn't answer anything, please reach out through the PharmD Fellowships at Novartis.com email. I will find my way. To, I, I have I have access to that inbox, so I will, I will I'll be able to answer things. If there's any general fellowship questions you have about the program as a whole, please feel free to answer the first one. You'll find the you know what our our folks there are, are very good about it. They'll respond to you in a timely basis. And please feel free to stay connected on LinkedIn. All right. So I want to thank everyone who came out and uh, stayed with us through this whole process, this whole uh, webinar. This is definitely our first go round. Um, so I appreciate uh, uh, you all coming in to listen and staying through for the uh, Q&A session. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the webinar. And um, I hope you all have a good evening. And 
it's the last thing to add. If any of you all have not signed up for the next uh, couple of weeks of webinars, uh, I highly encourage you to reach out if you want, uh, just to make sure that you get a chance to learn about all these other line functions as well and get a chance to ask those folks questions. All right, thank you so much and I hope you have a good night. Bye.